And then the first tricky spot, mm-hmm. an off-camber right-hand turn. Oh, and it really is. Yeah, I hit that with some heat in 2014 and went down fast and hard on my left side. Uh, it's sort of a decomposed granite. And so it just tore right through my shorts. Uh, it wasn't a serious injury, but, you know, a, a little bit of a raspberry. And since I was wearing Rafa bibs, it was definitely expensive. Leadville, the podcast for the 100-mile mountain bike race, the show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready, and freaks you out for the highest and arguably the hardest one-day mountain bike race in the country. On this show, we go to the buffet. It's a feeding, everyone. We're going to talk a lot about food. Dr. Kevin Sprouse, medical director for the EF Education First Dray Pack, presented by Cannondale Pro Cycling Team. I know that was a mouthful, but it's a food show. <laughs> has a practical prescription for... For your race nutrition, including changes you need to start making right now. Rebecca Rush will reveal what's in her feed bag and our questions for the feed, uh, Queen, that is. Fatty and I will go over our Leadville menus. We'll talk about that first opportunity to eat in our course segment. And Jonathan Lee's training advice for the show is going to have you outside on a long ride, putting everything you learned about eating in this show into practice. I am Michael Houghton. Some people call me Hottie. Six-time attendee, five-time starter, four-time finisher of the Leadville Trail 100. So, Mr. 654 also works. Here with me, Mr. 22-21-20, Eldon Fatty Nelson, who's working on his 22nd Leadville Trail 100. He has 21 starts and 20 finishes. It's a number show, Fatty, as it should be. This event is all about numbers. Leadville is at 10,000 feet. The race is 103 miles long. You climb over 12,000 feet. You race in under nine hours, and you get a gold buckle. Hmm. Of all the numbers associated with Leadville, Fatty, what has been the most important one to you? Uh, You know, first off, I got to say the 22, 21, 20 sounds like measurements. (laughs) Good ones. They would be good. They are also not even in the same zip code as what I'm in. But I'm going to narrow my most important numbers down to two different ones. You know how long-winded I am. I can't pick just one. The first number is four, as in four miles. That is the distance from the pavement to the summit of the power line climb as you go from three quarters to the final quarter of the race. If you know that number, you can avoid all the mind games. The crux of this whole race otherwise plays with you. It's exactly four miles Don't let the near infinite number of false flats ever convince you it is any shorter. More importantly than that, though, especially in our Feeding Frenzy special episode of the podcast is the number 250. That is how many hourly hourly calories folks need to plan on consuming for this race. Hitting that number every hour can be the difference between finishing fast and finishing slow or not finishing at all. We will definitely be talking more about those calorie counts in a moment. Yeah, I hope everyone's hungry because this (laughs) podcast is going to be a feeding. The Leadville Podcast is brought to you by Shimano. Uh, Fatty, how are you and the hammer, your wife, gearing your bikes for this year's Leadville? Well, we're training with identical drivetrains, 32 up front, 1146 in the back, Obviously, on the, uh, Shimano's XT Di2, I have drooled all over that drivetrain many times in this show. However, I just placed an order for two 28 teeth chain rings. The truth is, you just don't use your tallest gear very often in this race. I would rather be able to have the ability to stay on my bike in the hard climbs. The final three miles of Columbine, for example, the entirety of Powerline, if it's possible than to be able to pick up an extra mile or two per hour hauling down Hagerman's. Plus, we're going to be racing the Breck Epic this year. Uh, That's a six-day stage race, and it ends the day before Leadville. (laughs) And we plan to be using the same same bikes, same drivetrains, both races. 
And that is, you know, I, I think lower gears are going to serve us. Uh, guess how often we're going to need to change or charge the batteries for our DI2 setups for all of those seven long days of racing? I think uh, out of a matter of caution, you'd want to charge maybe every other day, something like that? Yeah. You know, I would have thought so too. I mean, you, you use your phone a reasonable amount and you need to charge it every day, right? But I'm not mm-hmm. actually even expecting to bring the chargers out at all. Uh, I've been writing my new specialized Epic for about two months now, about four days per week. And the battery indicator still shows I have more than half a charge. I have not charged it once since I set the thing up. It's crazy futuristic spaceship science stolen from alien ship technology, I tell you. Mm-hmm. Uh, to find out more about the XT Di2 system or all the fine Shimano products, go to bike.shimano.com. We will also have a link at leadville100podcast.com. <laughs> And now on to the course. Each show, we are discussing a segment of the Leadville Out and Back. We're doing this in order. So all you have to do is listen to the shows. You follow along. You're going to get a point-by-point, mile-by-mile breakdown of the Leadville 100 course. In show two, we took you out of downtown Leadville and on to the first section of dirt. That criterium on knobbies, as we called it, is done and the first climb of the day, St. Kevin's, is now before us. Yeah, it's, pr- uh, it's spelled Kevin's, pronounced Kevin's. We are not making a mistake here. <laughs> uh, yep, you are six miles into the race, right? And on its own, if you were just riding it uh, a week before the race, you would think St. Kevin's is no big deal. It's about uh, two and a half miles and 1,150 feet of climbing. That is not too much. And this is one of those little sections you'll probably go out and do if you show up to Leadville early and mm-hmm. ride it once or twice. It's not a bad idea because it's one of the first segments you're going to see. My strategy on Kevin, St. Kevin's, has been to sit in. How do you ride it? Well, it, it really is an it depends kind of answer. When I've been single speeding it, I got to be out in front because you either walk it on a single speed or you fly it. Um, other times, you know, your goal, your time goal really affects how you're going to, how you're going to race, uh, St. Kevin's. If you're going for sub nine hours, then getting up front is very important. There are a lot of people close to each other, even still into, you know, six or so miles into this race and toward the middle or back of the group, you are moving slow, slower than the pace you need to be. If you want to get that big nine hour belt buckle, once you're there, however, There is just not much you can do about it. Once you're going up St. Kevin's, jockeying around, moving forward is just not worth the amount that you gain. So if you are planning for a fast time at Leadville, meaning a sub nine time, you need to have moved forward the amount necessary on the pavement and on that flat dirt road section we talked about in the last episode you are more or less stuck in the position that you have entered St. Kevin's once you begin that steep uphill. Mm -hmm. And if you are going for a placing or a a low eight-hour time, does your strategy change at all? Well, hopefully, if you are going for something really fast up on a podium, you are uh, already far enough forward. Uh, The times that I've started in the Silver Corral, which is very, very close to the front of the race, uh, St. Kevin's is no longer a crowded problem. You just really sort of fly up it. Mm-hmm. So that's the strategy. Let's get to the specifics now of this portion of the Leadville Trail 100. You can tell the climb is going to begin by mileage. You're 6.1 miles into the race, mm-hmm. or you can look for the false flat Jeep road, a couple of cattle guards, a subtle left. Suddenly there'll be more trees around you than... Kevin's pitches upwards. Yes, yes, it does. There used to be a, a loose spot. In fact, this whole section here, the steep part, used to be pretty loose. The first year I did it, uh, I was slipping and sliding quite and a rutted. bit. But re- yeah, and rutted. But recently they graded it. And if it has rained, then it's both smooth and grippy going up Kevin's. So I have found in the last couple of times I've gone up Kevin's, especially uh, last summer, 
the ride and the climb itself pretty good. It was pretty easy to get up. Uh, could be crowded, though, on this climb, as Fatty said, with very uh, little opportunity for passing people. Yeah, and it really just isn't worth the spend. Uh, be where you want to be by the time you begin that, uh, by the time you get to six miles in the race. So let's break down a few of the numbers here. For this climb, the first mile is killer. So basically mile six to 7.1, you are averaging 9% great. That is steep. Then you hit that hairpin. There's a hairpin, a hard left, you could say. And that sort of, that is your signal that you are going to be at the end of the steep stuff in just another few hundred feet. You're still going to be climbing for about 1.3 more miles, but it is nowhere near as bad. And this, that hairpin should set off a little alarm bell because this is a great time to eat. For the first time since you crossed that starting line because magically everything sort of thins out here. There aren't riders bumper to bumper, handlebar to handlebar. You're not going to be in the same crowded situation that you were even one minute ago. Yeah, it's going to roll a bit from this point forward. After that hard hairpin we just talked about on forward for those next 1.3 miles, but my overall memory is the sense of the uh, burning in my legs fading a bit here. So you feel mm-hmm. yourself start to recover a little bit. And it's around the section that Mara Lee, one of the race founders and directors, can always be spotted yelling for everyone and ringing a cowbell. Yeah, yeah. I have a personal tradition of yelling, I love you, Mara Lee, as I go by. <laughs> We all love Marilee. You can't help but love her. She's the one who, if you are lucky, is going to put the finisher's medal around your neck when you get to the finish line. So you want to give her a little love right now. That that said, I don't know if she yells anything back because the sound of blood in my ears is just way too loud. And and then the first tricky spot, Mm -hmm. an off-camber right-hand turn. Oh, and it really is. Yeah, I hit that with some heat in 2014 and went down fast and hard on my left side. Uh, It's sort of a decomposed granite, and so it just tore right through my shorts. Uh, It wasn't a serious injury, but, you know, a a little bit of a raspberry. And since I was wearing Rafa bibs, it was definitely expensive. So you cross another fire road. You go through a fire gate, which will be open on race day, but not before. So, you know, you have to watch for that during uh, any expeditions you go out to get to know the trail. And then... You more or less descend a little bit of up and down to the Carter Aid Station. This is a neutral aid station. You can't have crew there, and that's all on double track. Yeah, it's nice double track. In fact, I like this section of the course. It's, it's fun, pretty. pretty. It's, there's lots of trees overhanging. Come, you want, again, this is another spot you want to remember. Just put it, log it in your memory bank real quick because you're going to have to ride it coming back. A right turn brings you, uh, after Carter Aid, brings you onto the turquoise pavement the right around turquoise lake so turquoise lake Mm -hmm. will be on your left a big wide good tarmac road going straight downhill and this this spot as you turn right off the dirt onto the pavement in my mind is a great spot to eat in fact this is usually where i take my first good gobble of food here we find more roadie style riding like we did coming out of uh led downtown leadville left at the bottom though you're gonna so you're gonna be screaming downhill i mean 30 35 Mm -hmm. you'll be all topped out in your gears you'll be in your highest gear gonna be pace lining drafting maybe taking turns with other riders then you're gonna bottom out on this pavement on this this ride around turquoise lake there's a left at the bottom on pavement be careful here because it can be gritty uh around this corner and you're going to be going fast. And there are potholes around the bend. There are. They're, and they're marked. They spray paint around the, the big holes. But, you know, it's a it's a rural road and it is not perfect pavement. And even though you're on a mountain bike, uh, you don't want to be surprised by, you know, a big open, you know, hole <laughs> in the road. Mm-hmm. So in any case, remember that road section that you just flew down in a matter of seconds because you're going to be riding it again in the other direction much later in the day when you are much more tired. Yep. So you've made that left, and now you've got a gentle mile of climbing ahead of you. If you didn't eat as you exited the Carter Summit Neutral Aid Station, be certain to do it now. You are not going to have as good or as easy of an opportunity for food again for quite a while because you're going to be in a pace line, then technical climbing, then technical descending for the next little while. And we'll talk about that next time. But now is a good time to eat. Yep. Get it down the throat when you can. And one last strategy tip. 
do what you can to start forming a group here. Right? Mm-hmm. Again, is it road? This is tarmac. You start pitching up once you've hit that hard left and gotten through it safely. Look for other people to get with. Yep. In just a few moments, you're going to be turning on to Haggermans. And if you're already have if you're already in a group here, you'll be able to shave some precious seconds and effort of your race by working in a pace line. Yeah. Not a lot of people think to have a group already formed when they get onto Hagerman's. Uh, you're saying Hagerman's. I say Hagerman's. I We'll find out which one of us is right. It <laughs> probably doesn't matter. We know for sure it's Kevin's, not Kevin. So I don't know. Who cares? Uh, but the, the, my point, and I do have one, is if you have a group put together by the time you make that sharp right turn onto Hagerman's, you are going to have a much better time because it is a gentle uphill and a pace line can make a massive difference over the next couple of miles. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, when you reach, you'll know that Hagerman's Hagerman's is close mm-hmm. when you hear a lot of people cheering because yeah. people stand there, they park their cars, they drive down to that point, park, and cheer you as you make the right onto the dirt. Yep. Hagerman's Hagerman's whatever you want to call it. Um, we're going to pick up from there in our next show. That's we'll take right. take you up Hagerman's and then up Sugarloaf. Yeah. If you have questions, though, about the course, criticism of our takes, leave your inquiries and comments on our website, leadville100podcast.com. You can tweet them as well with the hashtag leadville100podcast or give us a text, leave us a voicemail at 719-453-1514. Can you believe that we are at the end of our third core segment and only 14 miles into the race? We are going to have to pick it up. Hadi, have you ever ridden with a noodly bad stem on a mountain bike? <laughs> Not on a mountain bike, but I had a time trial bike that uh, had a pretty ugly connection between the cowbell bars <laughs> and, and the fork. Yeah, I'll admit. It, it, I swear, until you've ridden a bad one, they are the most ignored component on a bike. Once you ride a good one, you start realizing how important they are. I've been riding with a new M6 mountain stem from Envy on my Epic, and you can feel such an enormous difference. Like how so? Like when I stand up and row, you know I'm a standing climber, right? All that single mm-hmm. speeding. The bar matters for that, of course, but the stem is just incredible. I feel like so much more of my energy is winding up going into the bike instead of into flexing. And the M6 series carbon-bodied stems, they're not only stronger, they're also lighter than aluminum stems. They absorb vibration, so you get a little bit of damping to go along with your uh, suspension fork, which you definitely want to have when you're in Leadville. Trust me. I th- Actually, you've ridden with uh, a rigid at Leadville as well, mm-hmm. haven't you? Mm-hmm. And, but I didn't have the Envy stem, which was probably a mistake. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I didn't either back then, but uh, we have both learned we're older and wiser. And let's not ignore the fact that Envy stems are just gorgeous. They really make your bike look better. Just, I mean, those guys... Set aside performance for a second. Everything Envy makes is so damn beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, looks do matter. I mean, they make you feel better about your setup, your bike. You want to look down and look at your bike and go, that looks cool, and I'm going to look cool on it when I'm breaking nine hours. Yeah. So you're you're probably going to be staring at the stem on your bike quite (laughs) a lot between now and Leadville and during Leadville. I mean, for sure, like nine, ten hours, you might be looking at your stem. May as well be... A sexy one. I wonder if Chris Froome uh, rides with an Envy stem. He should be. He'd be like, wow, this is a sexy stem I am looking at. <laughs> anyway, no, there is no sexier stem on the market. That is my point. And you can learn more about the M6 stem, four lengths from 40 millimeters to 85 millimeters. I use the 85. The hammer uses a lot shorter on Envy.com. E-N-V-E dot com. Your women's champion, Rebecca Rush, from Ketchum, Idaho. Welcome back, Rebecca. Okay, Fatty, the four-time champ, Rebecca Rush, standing by now. Time for questions for the queen. Yeah, thanks, Adi. Nobody knows and teaches endurance racing like Rebecca Rush. She is, of course, as you mentioned, a four-time Leadville champ. And that ain't nothing. She's sharing all of her wisdom at a new Rush Academy camp. There's a gravel version. There's a mountain bike version. And you will ride with and learn directly from 
Reber Rush. Learn more at Rebecca Rush. That's R U S C H dot com. Reba, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Today, I want to ask you food questions because I think a food strategy is truly the make or breakiest thing you can do at the Leadville 100. What do you eat while you train? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about food because I honestly feel like it is probably one one of the biggest things of maybe two things um, that I feel that endurance racers really blow. They yeah. really they really mess up here. And I know plenty of people who are much fitter than I am, much faster, much better trained, and they really throw it all down the tank um, because they don't have their nutrition dialed. And and eating is training. You know, the folks mm-hmm. at Goose say that, that eating is training. And it really is a food strategy, like you said. I mean, you can imagine when you're at 10,000 feet, you can barely breathe, you know, you're full on exertion, the last thing you want to do is is chew something yeah. or even open it or even to catch your breath enough to put the food in. And so it really does require practice. And that's why in training, I really do try to eat as if I'm going to race. Yes. And so I know a lot of people who they go out on the two hour ride and they don't take any food because they're trying to drop a few pounds or they're trying to, you know, get lean for the race. And this is a big mistake. Um, On the bike is no time to be, to be trying to, you know, have a weight loss program. This is the time where you're actually training your body to take those calories and burn them as fuel. And what happens is if you don't, if you don't feed the body, it starts to burn. It does start to burn your fat or other stores that you have, but you're not teaching it to quickly access that goo carbohydrate that you're putting in and so you want to teach your body basically to burn the fuel you're putting in right away and so I do like to um, train as I'm racing and this is a good time to experiment different types of foods that Mm -hmm. you like Um, whether you like solids whether you like liquids whether you like sweet or whether you like salty or whether you like no flavor at all These are important things to really figure out. And usually it's a variety of all those things. Um, You know, Goo calls it like your your food palate and Mm -hmm. and your you get flavor fatigue. And so sometimes what might taste really good, you know, in desert, you know, hot terrain um, in mountain high elevation terrain may not be the same flavor that you want. And so generally, um, if I'm going on a longer, slower day, I really like to take solid calories. And especially if it's a long ride with friends, one of my nice, long, slow days, um, I might even take a sandwich because the demands that you're putting on your your body are are different. You know, you you don't have all the blood leaving your stomach where it can't digest. And so I use that those days to experiment with some bars, some other solid foods, because y- you know you can't do um, liquid and gels all the time. If I'm doing intervals and things like that, uh, you know, I am doing more race type food that might be liquid calories, um, you know, gucci stuff like that. That is a little bit. Um, less energy to chew and swallow and digest. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of mixing it up in training. Um, and then I am also also a big fan of really trying to make sure that you, you are training your body to hydrate and process the calories. And then I'm very religious about when I finish a ride. Um, even if it's, if I'm in serious training mode, I do drink a recovery drink almost every day after almost every ride, even if it's an easy one. And that's just a quick, you know, a quick chocolate smoothie shake. Um, I happen to use goo recovery drink. Um, I really like it on cold days. I'll put it in coffee. Um, and mix it up. It's kind of like a little mocha is kind of good. Um, but yeah, so I'm pretty religious about, and and I do feel like, you know, the recovery drinks important. I talk to people about, you know, you can do put in this really hard, great interval session and then why not take your workout to the 100% level by recovering correctly and getting that um, recovery drink in within 30 minutes of finishing? Um, the alternative, if you don't do that, you don't take advantage of the glycogen stores being open and receptive, is you do this hard workout and you maybe only get 80, 90, 95% benefit from it. But um, I'm all about putting something in your mouth. It's an easy way to get 100% benefit from your workout. Uh, before you get to the starting line, 
What do you eat? On race day. So, yeah, yeah this is always a tricky one because um, Leadville is so early. And, and then we've all heard that, you know, you should get you should eat your breakfast three hours before, you know, your start time to allow for proper digestion and food to be absorbed and all that kind of stuff. That's pretty hard um, for a 6 a.m. start to, you know, get up at three. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit lazy about that. And so Leadville is, you know, if, if I do have the luxury of that for an event, I will have, um, a normal breakfast that's three hours before, and it would be something, uh, rice, eggs, avocado would be kind of a mm-hmm. standard race breakfast for me. Um, however, in Leadville, I opt to sleep another hour and instead, um, have a really good dinner, very similar dinner the night before of, uh, you know, eggs, rice or chicken and rice and, and avocado and some amino acids. Um, but on Leadville race morning, I sort of started opting towards having, uh, sleeping an extra hour, you know, just putting the nutrition in a couple hours before the race, um, and doing, doing a smoothie. And so, uh, that the calories are more easily broken down and digested a little bit more quickly. And so I would do, um, basically a goo, a goo smoothie, um, you know, a bit of protein recovery drink. Um, even though you haven't done the race yet, maybe a little bit of almond milk, depending on if you're, you know, how you sit with milk and some, right. you know, some fruits and, and that's really it. Um, so sort of a lighter liquid meal that can di- ti- that can digest more quickly. I'm hydrating in the morning with with water and some electrolytes um, pretty quickly. As soon as I wake up, I'm kind of sipping, sipping, sipping on water um, while I'm getting ready. Um, but I stop hydrating about 30 to 45 minutes before the start line. And that allows you time to go to the bathroom, empty your bladder, um, yeah. and not be standing on the start line having to go. So that's why as soon as I get up, I start drinking water and electrolytes and then I stop at about 45 minutes out. Um, and then right on the start line, you know, I'm going to yeah. have, you know, 15 minutes, 15 minutes before, um, I'm going to have half a Red Bull and one goo and then I'm, I'm ready to rock. All right. And the nutrition really starts immediately as the gun goes off. You know, it's it's basically, you know, an eating competition with a bike ride. I think I've heard you say that before. It is. It is an eating competition disguised as a bike race. Uh, <laughs> I have many more questions about food. We're going to save them for the next episode of this podcast. But just a preview, we're going to be talking about how much and how often you eat during the race, when you should be eating during the race. And finally, when things go wrong, you get a bad stomach, what do you do during the race? So things to think about, and we'll talk with you again real soon. That's it for this episode of Questions for the Queen. Thanks, Reba. Thanks, Patty. I love that practice eating. I love that strategy. Mm-hmm. I always, when I when the training gets serious, I start wrapping my little personal sandwiches like I would do on race day. I start packing my pockets. I eat while I ride. A yep. lot of us mountain bikers love to do. We love to stop and chat and eat and have our bar. <laughs> that doesn't happen at Leadville, folks. Nope. You get you want to keep moving at Leadville. You want to be able to eat and ride. That is crucial to doing well at this race. Yep. Uh, yep. If you've got if you've got your own question for the Queen, leave us a comment at Leadville One Hundred Podcast dot com. Or tweet. Again, that hashtag is Leadville100podcast. And, of course, you can call and text us 719-453-1514. Yep. And thanks again to the hardest working woman in mountain biking, Reba Rush. Uh, One thing, and it's sort of breaking away from Leadville for a second with this, Hadi. Of course, uh, podcast listeners won't necessarily know. We are recording on Friday, and this comes out on Tuesday. And in between... Reba is one of 34 people who is riding the 340-mile Dirty Kanza XL, 340 miles on gravel in self-supported manner. Holy cow. She seriously, if there's anyone who knows what they're doing, it is Reba Rush. (laughs) Fatty and I are going to talk about our Leadville food experiences in a second, but let's talk about who is supplying your nutrition. Mm-hmm. Race day and training fuel remains one of the three keys to a successful Leadville. Yet it, nutrition, remains the most complex question. Now, you can take some of the guessing out of the equation by using our sponsor, The Feed. The Feed 
is a fantastic, convenient, and economical way to get what you need on an ongoing basis. Yep. And I, of course, use the feed to get my Goo Roctane gels, my pre-race starting line bonk breaker bars, as well as my Martins, or Mortons, I'm learning it is pronounced, drink mix, which uh, Jonathan Vodders himself told me to use during the Leadville Trail 100 last year. And a little preview here, I should point out, completely unprompted, completely, you're going to hear the pro cycling doctor I talk with in just a second talk about Morton's. That stuff has some momentum and interest of scientists, I tell you. And our podcast Latin listeners can get a great price on a training and racing pack custom created for Leadville racers. Go to thefeed.com forward slash Leadville for the race pack. And there's a link on that page to go to the training pack as well. And be sure to use the code Leadville 15 for a 15% discount on either of those boxes, the training box or the race day box. Again, the feed.com forward slash Leadville and use the Leadville 15 code at checkout. Yep. Good price in the first place and an even better price when you use the code. Now, back to food, some more, more food talk here. Oh, yeah. Uh, Remember how I told you last to show I rarely have a problem with cramps? So jealous. Uh, Well, I kind of have the same story with food. I really have no issues. I can and do eat what I want. Gels, blocks, stroopwafels. I've eaten danishes and strudel (laughs) during the Leadville 100. I once ate a McDonald's uh, Big Mac during a 100-mile mountain bike ride. (laughs) Wouldn't try that at 10,000 feet because the gut does weird things. Uh But otherwise, I can pretty much stomach anything. Uh, I... I am at once envious of you and also a little bit horrified by you. (laughs) My plan is the exact opposite of yours. I like how you're describing at Leadville all the rest of the time. (laughs) But when I am racing, my plan is so monk-like and completely monastic in comparison. I can say my complete food plan in two sentences. One gel consumed every half hour as prompted by my GPS timer. I have it set to go off every half hour. Also, nurse a Morton's 320-calorie bottle all the time and drink water when I feel like it. In that way, I get precisely 250 or up to 300 calories per hour. No sick gut ever energy on tap for eight-plus hours. So sounds it works for you, right? I mean, it's what works for you. That's what matters. Me, I can gorge. I can, I I love the peanut butter, banana, bacon, honey sandwich. I've made those before. Had them at Leadville before. They're delicious. To me, fatty food is mood. So I'm trying to put a little carrot out there. Hey, I got a Danish coming. I got a cinnamon roll sitting at Twin (laughs) Lakes. So uh, what I eat in the morning, I have bacon. Bacon is not really a a race an endurance food, but it puts me in a good mood. I love the smell of bacon. I love the taste of bacon. I want to go with a start line in a good mood. Oh, That's yeah. why I eat kind of what I want to eat. I am all for that. Whatever works for you, works for you. The important thing is you need to make sure that it works for you. And the way that I eat, I understand, you know, the more I listen to Reba and our guest that I'm going to introduce in just a second, I'm a real corner case doing really well with a very, very simple plan. And you should not necessarily use me as your plan. However, you need to figure it out. Anyway, so the... Uh, with all of that said, there it, there are definitely things that I need to personally change and I'm actually planning to change for this racing of the Leadville 100. See, I just had this really informative, extremely prescriptive conversation with Dr. Kevin Sprouse, who is the medical director for the EF Education First Dray Pack presented by Cannondale Pro Cycling Team. He works with elite athletes around the world and has a ton of really great useful advice for any endurance racer, but especially for folks racing the Leadville 100. And he is about to tell us how you can get a faster time or have a better race. Dr. Sprouse, welcome. It's great to have you here. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. I have done the Leadville 100 20 times, and it wasn't until the 15th time that I feel like I understood how much to eat, when to eat, and so forth. That is a lot of trial and error. I'm hoping you can help my listeners understand uh, some of the guardrails for how they can eat and drink and have a successful race without that many mistakes. It is tough to figure out how 
how to fuel and how to hydrate for a race like this. And like I was saying, 15 times is probably pretty average because you, you only get so many, I mean, you get one shot a year to test out um, how you're going to perform at a race like Leadville because there's nothing else like it. Yeah. So, you know, it does, it does take some trial and error, but, but I think we can trim it down for your listeners and um, give them some high yield advice that can really help speed that up and, and get them big, hopefully big benefits this year. Fantastic. So what are the basics? As, as people develop their food plan for this race, what are the things they must know in order to have, a, you know, to have a good stomach and lots of energy for 100 miles? There's a couple ways to approach it. One, you want to look at how you come into the race. So mm. it's not just what you eat on the bike, but it's how you set yourself up for race day and coming to the line full. So when we say full, we talk about we're, we're talking about glycogen stores, and glycogen is stored carbohydrate in the muscle and in the liver, but primarily we're talking about muscle stores. And you want to have that fuel tank as, as topped off as you can get it. Um, and that's where this idea of carb loading comes in, but the way that people tend to approach it is really flawed. So this, this idea of doing a big pasta dinner the night before mm-hmm. is not sufficient to fill the tank, and it's probably shooting yourself in the foot in that you put in a whole bunch of simple carbs, um, this massive dose of food. It draws water out of your body into the digestive system, ends up giving you gut problems, and you're actually starting with a tank lower than if you had um, taken a more moderate approach. So in approaching the race, the better way to do it is three, four days out, a week out, start, you're starting to you know, decrease your training anyway, and then slowly uh, or, or moderately increase your carbohydrate intake over all of those meals in the week leading up so that you kind of hypercompensate, you overfill those tanks, and you come to the start line full. And how about for on-bike nutrition? Sure. So now you've made it to the start line, you're ready to go, the glycogen's full. Um, everyone is a little different when, with what they can tolerate on the bike, um, and that's perfectly fine. There's mm-hmm. not a magic formula, but if we look at broad strokes, you can take in about two to 300 calories per hour of of carbohydrate, and you're going to burn more than that, right? right? So when you're on the bike or doing any exercise, you're burning primarily two fuels, either fat or carbohydrate. When it's a slow kind of endurance pace, ideally you're burning primarily fat and not dipping into those carbohydrate stores as much. On a mountain bike race, especially like Leadville, you've got some periods of time that should be primarily fat burning, but you've got a lot of explosive interval type, you know, hill climbs, you're passing somebody. It is, though it is an endurance race, it's not simply an endurance effort, which you know from being out there 20 times, right? Sure, sure. I mean, yeah. you're, when you're going up St. Kevin's, when you're going up Sugarloaf, when you're going up Columbine, when you're coming back up Powerline, I know them by heart, <laughs> but exactly. yes, you are in, sometimes you're in going flat and you are at a pretty reasonable, reasonable pace. And sometimes you are fully in the red and, you know, breathing triple time just to, you know, keep keeping from blacking out. Yeah. Just to keep the bike from falling over. Yeah. And so, so with that in mind, you want to maintain these glycogen stores and this carbohydrate intake, even when the effort is fairly low, you know, fairly endurance. Mm-hmm. And so you'll have hours where, you know, you feel like, oh, it's, it's maybe not that hard. I'll, I'll eat a little bit and drink. And then, and then you hit those times where it's really hard and suddenly you need to eat, but you can't. So taking advantage of the easier time is, is really important. And having sources of fuel that are real food for that time, I think is really beneficial. So whether that's, you know, uh, rice cakes or sandwiches mm-hmm. or, um, and by sandwiches, I'm not talking like a Subway hoagie, but a, a very small, <laughs> you know, a couple pieces of bread, um, maybe a peanut butter and honey, maybe uh, ham and cheese, you know, whatever your body tolerates well. Um, but something that's like a, a real food. Yeah, yeah. And then when you, get, when, when you get to the times where you've got to get more dense calories in quicker, 
that's where you can use bars and gels and those type of things. So having having some options is important. Knowing what your body digests well is important too. Most people will do really well with like those rice cakes if you've ever tried those. Oh yeah, um, love those. They're they're great. It, it's a fantastic source of fuel. You can doctor them up to taste kind of however you want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a few people who don't tolerate them well. You know that don't do well with rice, and and that you need to know ahead of time. Um, but for most people, that's going to be a really good fuel source that uh, can, you know, you can you can make taste. It can be sweet. It can be savory. You can you can make it suit you. Yeah. Um, then you got to think about getting some calories through your hydration, um, and that's an easy way to get calories in as long as you tolerate it. And I think if if you think about the kind of the different way you can get real food, you can get gels um, and bars, or you can get strictly hydration calories. And I think as you work up that spectrum, they get less and less tolerable. Um, so, you know, if you just take liquid calories uh, and, and very hypertonic or very dense solutions, that's when people tend to get gut rot pretty, uh, pretty reliably. Mm-hmm. And so using that sparingly, not making that your sole source for a race like this, of this distance and intensity, is really important. If you're doing a crit, then it's fine. You know, just sure. do liquid calories, you're good, if you need any at all. Um, but for this, you really want to play across that whole spectrum of foods. There is an interesting product um, that uh, I think some of your athletes, some of your listeners m- may want to check out called Morton. Just to be upfront, I have no interest in this company mm-hmm. at all. Um, but I think they've got a really interesting product that is going to work well for a lot of people. Again, is it going to work well for 100%? No. And so it's, sure. it's something that people need to try. But um, the the you know it's a it's a drink mix that was formulated kind of in concert with Nike's effort to break the two hour marathon mark, and it gives you more calories per bottle in a in a mixture that is more easily digestible than anything else that's out there. Um, so you know those types of uh, advances are are worth are worth trialing before you get there. Um, and I think for a lot of people are going to be beneficial. So finding those ways to get in liquid calories as well um, that, that your gut tolerates is really important. And, you know, I flog this horse all the time is no matter what you're doing, whether it is rice cakes or Morton's or whatever uh, food source you decide to go with, you got to trial it out. And, of course, with uh, this episode coming out about 10-plus weeks before the race, you're getting close to the edge of where you need to settle on something. So whatever you're going to use or things that you're experimenting with, it's time to take them out on a ride and see how you do during that day for you know the best simulation that you can get. Um, if, if you yeah. don't feel good at the end of a, a long training ride, you're not going to feel good at the end of a long ride at race effort at high altitude. For sure. And that's a really important point that you make. It, it, you're not talking about taking it out for an hour and a half spin. No. You take it out and use the stuff in a race effort type scenario that's mm-hmm. going to be a longer day. You know, if you've got, if you've got the op- option to go to altitude and try it out, do that. Like, try to replicate it a little bit. Best um, you can, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And if you can't do that, that's okay, too. But you know, to the degree that you can try it out in real world scenario, definitely do. Do you have any Leadville specific advice? That is the Leadville environment, altitude, temperature. Yes, although my so as a physician, my thinking goes a little bit differently here, mm-hmm. um, and we can maybe you, you can push me back the other way in just a second. But <laughs> when I hear altitude effort. Um, what I see so often that is such an easy thing to rectify that is often ignored um, that falls into the dietary field is blood iron levels. And so we see that people who train in, you know, for, for endurance efforts, they tend to run through iron stores and maybe not replenish them the way that they should dietarily. And we'll look at something called ferritin, which is an iron storage protein in the blood. 
easily testable, a very like routine laboratory test. Yep. And we'll see that it's you know remarkably low, and sometimes sometimes you know pathologically low, um, but sometimes just lower than it's going to allow you to do what you want to do at altitude. And so if if you can address that. 10 weeks out by changing your diet and taking an iron supplement, mm-hmm. then that's a huge benefit and a huge you know, pothole in the road that you've sidestepped. Um, so for me, you know, I think looking at some of those basic things up front, because, you know, if you, if you're iron deficient and you're borderline anemic as an athlete, I don't care what you eat and drink on the bike that day, you're going to suffer and, and probably, you know, fail at your at your attempt one between the the difficulty of the race and the altitude and everything else but if you make sure that everything's taken care of from a physiologic standpoint before you get there then the on the bike uh dietary stuff is useful so to me taking that early look at some of the some of those important factors is is crucial and often overlooked you know, last year uh, when uh, Jonathan Vodders was coaching me, that is uh, something that he did. He had me uh, do a blood uh, blood workup, and after looking at it, he put me on an iron supplement. I didn't know why until now. So this was yeah. very, very and, interesting. And and what's what may also be interesting is that when we look at those things in athletes, we see again looking at a ferritin level, for instance. We may say, see that the lab says, well, as long as you're over 20, you're fine. Um, mm. And technically, that's true. You will sit at your desk and get through your workday and have no problems with a ferritin of 20. But if you go to do some you know, demanding athletic task with a ferritin of 20, it's not going to go well. And so it's not even always just looking at what the lab says is normal, but it's going to the sports medicine, sports performance literature and saying, okay, well, what truly supports the effort that I'm about to put out and making sure that you're there. Dr. Sprouse, this has been incredibly educational. I, I've been doing this race for 20 years, still learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, happy to do it. Good talking with you, Alden. You know, so many practical things here, Hadi. Mm-hmm. I There are three big things that I take away. Uh, first of all, I need to restart taking my iron supplements. Do you take one? I don't. Uh, I've been tested for ferritin levels. I've mm-hmm. always come back well. I know that you do before you take an iron supplement, you should go get tested first right. and make sure you actually need them. Yeah. Yeah. I had a very ordinary uh, ferritin level, and the idea was to get me well above normal. And I never tested afterward after taking the iron supplement, but I know that it's not something that can really hurt. So if you're going to be up at uh, altitude and you're going to be racing, start that now. Get that in you. Second thing, carbo-loading. I For... For I think like 18, 20 years, the Leadville race had a carbo-load spaghetti dinner before the day of the race. They didn't do that last year, which I think was new, but maybe that was because that actually wasn't doing you any good. But I'm I'm going to be practicing that sort of moderate increase of carbs uh, for the three or four days leading up to it. And then finally, the rice cakes. It's hearing what uh, Dr. Sprouse was saying about, uh, you know, gel after gel after gel not being the smartest way. And it's making me reevaluate a little bit. And uh, I, I have a fantastic rice cake recipe myself, just sort of customized, uh, using rice, uh, sushi rice, chicken broth, bacon. I think you would like that, Hottie. A little bit of brown sugar and just a little bit of soy sauce. And it is delicious. I will put that, my recipe for that, uh, adapted from Dr. Alan Lim's famous rice cake recipe in the show notes. Hey, Fatty, did I ever tell you about the time I lost the entire contents of my CPAC mid-ride in the middle of the wilderness? Oh, no. I I haven't heard it. I would love to hear it. But uh, my initial reaction is you must not have been using a Banjo Brothers back. Obviously. I had... I don't know what I had, actually, (laughs) but it stunk, whatever it was. And during a thrashing down a gravel road in Glacier National Park, the seat bag, which was stuffed with my flat repair essentials and a multi-tool, unzipped, and all that stuff became grizzly bear food. 
Uh, you should have been you should have been back in a Banjo Brothers bag. I have one on every single bike I own and have been using them for a dozen years, have never lost a seat pack. They're simple, they're bomb proof, they just work. Yep, and they are worth it, whatever it is. You don't want to lose the contents of your seat pack, whether that be in Glacier or Leadville or wherever. <laughs> you will be stranded and very, very mad. So check out Banjo's Banjo Brothers. Tough practical, and affordable, Minneapolis-based, in business since 2003. Their products are available in your finer local bike shops or to get a 15% discount off your order, go to banjobrothers.com forward slash fatty dash favorites. Fatty dash favorites has to be there. You need that little dash. Yep. I just ordered a frame pack for myself. All right, let's go to training tips now with Trainer Road's coach, Jonathan Lee. Yeah, I really trust Jonathan. He loves riding. He loves racing, thinks about it just constantly in a, at a level I really can't even comprehend. But then he boils it down to a level that I can grasp. T minus 10 weeks, Jonathan. Holy <laughs> cow, the time is going fast. <laughs> yeah. It- I mean, yeah, it's it's getting close and uh, yeah, changes to training are starting to happen for sure. So I would like to ask a little bit about me. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, my very favorite subject. <laughs> uh, so the kinds of rides that I feel like are good training for me, mm-hmm. um, I love to do a big, truly big ride during the weekend. This mm-hmm. uh, yesterday, I just went out and uh, along with Lisa, my wife, we did a 75 mile ride with around 11,000 feet of climbing. We can do that here in Alpine. (laughs) That's a solid ratio. Is stuff like that helping me for my race? You know, it is. And uh, we talked about structure, right? Uh, In a Mm -hmm. previous episode, and we talked about how important it is to have structure and it absolutely is. Uh, These sort of rides, though, where you don't have perhaps as much structure, but you're going out and doing something else, I feel like... Uh, you may not have structure, but it's a great opportunity for you to put in other objectives while you're still getting a lot of boost from fitness. Um, right. You know, Leadville for most of us, it's it's going to be you know it's going to be a big day. You're looking at possibly a double digit day uh, in terms of duration mm-hmm. and hours. Uh, that's a that's a really long day, and your body starts to do weird things when you're on a bicycle for that long. So it's important to make sure that you get outside to get those 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 you know those long rides in where you can figure out yep. the changes that happen to your body. Now, something that uh, you know with Trainer Road, the majority of our workouts we prescribe them inside, right? Um, we prescribe all of our workouts inside because that's the best arena to do your structured interval work. But that said, uh, it's it's something that if you get outside and you test, you know, you need to be testing equipment, testing nutrition, testing all these things, and I'm sure that we'll get into in future episodes. But these long rides, they're really a good thing. And I find that if you partner some intensity during the week, right, and you'll find Mm -hmm. that with like a lot of our training plans with Trainer Road, if you followed, if you were following those, you'd see that the weekend rides tend to be longer, lower intensity rides. Yep. So really, when you get outside for the weekend and you do that, that's not a bad thing at all. In fact, in many cases, it's a good thing because it's a good opportunity for you to test some stuff out as well. Um, that said, you just have to understand how it affects the larger picture of your fitness, right? Uh, because that can be a bit problematic. Yeah, for sure. For me, I feel like the the pay the payoff is worth the you know, the deviation from a structured plan. It is during these big rides that I find out whether I'm tolerating my nutrition choices and my fluid choices. I'm finding out whether my shoes fit, mm-hmm. which is a big deal. Totally. <laughs> you yes. want to know that you are not going to be dying with every pedal stroke seven miles into a race day. Yes. Yeah, and you know, trust me on this. <laughs> it's kind of interesting how you uh, how you put that. Like, you have to see if you're actually getting faster too. And you know, mm-hmm. you're preparing for Leadville. You're preparing for something that's really long. And chances are, you're not going to be on the trainer for five hours, six hours, upwards of that. That's crazy, right? Um, I have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and if you do it, that's great because I think that it builds a whole lot of mental tenacity. But at the same time, you're not out there testing your mountain bike. So I feel no. like you know, separating or keeping the two separate effectively is really the best way to do it. Um, but you should see during those rides as your training is progressing, you know, you won't see it immediately, give it four weeks or so, you know, but you should see improvement in your power output for extended durations. You should see that training work. Um, 
and this will sound like a plug for sure, but we've, we've like longed for something like that for so long. And we built a bunch of new features around that because we were frustrated with the fact that there was no good way to see if I was getting PRs at any distance or any duration that I actually, you know, self-select, you know? So, um, we put all those things into trainer road recently because we were frustrated with the very thing. It's like, I'm doing all my structured work, uh, but am I getting better at what I need for race day? So yeah, those weekend rides are awesome for that. And man, get set objectives, start testing everything and test early and often. So then that way you aren't trying something new on race day. Test early and often. That is good advice. And something that I, I you know, obviously it's pretty easy to tell uh, via Strava and all of the tools that we have near us that how, how well you are doing. Um, or the tricky thing though, remember this though, if you're using something like Strava, remember mm-hmm. the wind, remember the dirt, remember right. all the other variables, right? Cause that's one thing all the that factors. Can be, yeah, it can be a big misnomer. So that's why if you have power, uh, you know, it's King and then you can analyze that sort of thing. That's, that's definitely the best way to go. You know, everyone keeps talking about power, and so far I've never had a power meter on any bike. The only time I see power is when I am in the basement on my Wahoo kicker, you know, getting power from that, doing trainer road. So I I do appreciate the power. It's something that I just haven't made a part of my uh, outside riding yet. So Yep, and you um, don't need it for sure, right? Yeah, I mean, you don't need one outside. Inside, it's really nice because you can get structured work. But man, I can't, I can't speak highly enough to the benefits of using one. You don't mm-hmm. pace every single effort with it, but it's a direct measure of the work that you're doing. So it's super helpful on a day like Leadville. You just have to make sure, and we'll go into this in another point, that you factor in things like elevation and everything else. But uh, it's a really good way to make sure that you aren't pushing as hard because if you're using heart rate or anything else, you know, chances are you'll be pretty jazzed at the starting line and you'll be pretty excited. And, <laughs> and that heart rate is almost like funny numbers, you know? Um, yeah. And then yeah. you get to elevation and that's tricky too. Uh, or if you're using perception, you're excited to go. And then later on it, you know, you'll be at elevation and you'll just, you'll perceive that the world is terrible and hates you. So it's mm-hmm. pretty tricky. Um, but man, power is just, it's so helpful for that. And then you can really see if you're actually getting faster or if you're just Strava surfing the wind, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a great way to equalize things. Jonathan, thanks so much. My pleasure, Eldon. Talk to you soon. So All right, you- check out, yeah, check out trainerroad.com for in-depth training f- plans and info, and you'll find their podcast there too. And good to hear that uh, Mr. Program, Jonathan Lee, is also hip to and fine with those long outdoor rides. Yeah, you really got to do those longer rides to, to go along with the structured rides to figure out how is your food working, how are your how are your equipment pieces working, your shoes, your bike fit, your saddle, for crying out loud. Um, you know, it can't all happen in the basement, although for sure structured riding does make a difference. Gets, uh, it's a foundation that you build on. As we put the wraps on this one, Fatty, we'd like to remind everyone that this podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Music, and the home website, Leadville100podcast.com. Subscribing, rating, and reviewing us on your favorite podcast host keeps us going. Yep. And if you want to slap us around a little bit, tell us what we did wrong, then head on over to the website's uh, uh, comment section, and we'll be happy to argue with you because we are very argumentative people, as you can tell. Oh, yeah. So if you've got a question for the queen or for Jonathan or for either of us, leave us a voicemail or a text at 719-453-1514. You can also just tweet to anyone with the hashtag Leadville100podcast, and we will see it because we search on that hashtag obsessively. Good luck in your training. Check your feed for a new episode each Tuesday, and we'll see you at the finish line. (laughs) 